Well, hello there and welcome to the Disability Law Show. So uh, good to have you tuning into the show today. My name is John Scholes, just the host, the lawyer right there, James Fireman. You want to reach out to James and his team beyond the half hour of the show. You can do so anytime. Phone number works, 1-855-821-5900. Help at disabilityrights.ca. And if you want to ask some more questions, possibly get on the show later. There's a website. It's free. It's anonymous called My disabilityquestions.com mydisabilityquestions.com chances are we're going to get into that in a little bit here uh, as well but the main topic what you should know about addiction and disability claims hugely important topic that is on the way but James we always get going with the uh, case of the day the week that was pal what's cooking on your side I had a woman contact me last week and she was in a situation that I thought might be useful talking about with our broader audience because I imagine it's something that other people are faced with at times. And this is about the pre-existing exclusion clause, which sounds very complicated. In some cases it is. But it's very important for anybody who has been dealing with any type of medical issue, particularly if you've been dealing with it over some extended period of time, and you're contemplating a change in your job. You're contemplating moving to a different employer. It's really important that you understand how your disability policy works before you make that decision. So this woman contacted me because she had made a change in the previous year and before she had been at her new job for a year, she went off on disability leave because of a mental health issue. Now, the mental health issue was probably indirectly related to a condition that she'd been dealing with over an extended period of time. It was actually a new diagnosis, but the new diagnosis is more than likely related to issues she'd been having in the past. And so the insurance company had said, well, unfortunately, this happened in the first 12 months of coverage under our policy. And when that happens, there's this pre-existing exclusion that applies. And so if the pre-existing exclusion applies, they say, okay, have, have you had any treatment directly or indirectly for this condition? prior to you getting coverage for this insurance? If yes, then they look at whether you qualify for one of the exceptions. And in this case, she didn't. And the exceptions can vary from policy to policy. So you want to make sure you're looking at the specific language. But the reason I bring this up, the reason why I think it's really important, is because if you're in that scenario, if you have a long-term medical condition that you're dealing with, that is being managed by medication, by treatment, and you're able to work through it, and you're thinking about changing your job, changing your employer and therefore being covered under a new policy, that pre-existing exclusion clause will apply to you during the first year under that new policy. So if you move jobs, typically that means the first year that you're in the new job. Now I'm not saying to you that you should never move jobs ever again, but you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware that if you do become disabled, within that first year, there's a very good chance that you won't be entitled to get your disability benefits, whereas if you stay at your present job, you likely will. And so when you're thinking about whether or not to make the move, I'm not saying that this is the only thing that you should be focusing on. Obviously not at all. There's any number of different criteria, not the least of which is your happiness in your job or how much they're paying you. Sure. But you also have to be aware that this does create a vulnerability and that should be factored into your decision making. And especially if you are in a situation where your disability is progressive, where over time it is getting worse and you have some concern, more than just the vague concern that most of us live with, but some concern that the next 12 months you may well wind up having to go on disability leave for an extended period of time. If you feel like you're in that scenario, you really want to think long and hard about whether it's worthwhile making the move because of the risk it creates. Again, I'm not telling you you shouldn't do it. I'm not saying don't make the move, but you need to be aware of what happens if you do and things don't go the way that you want them to, that your health deteriorates more quickly than you're hoping that it will. That affects both short-term and long-term? No, actually, that's a really good point. Short-term disability benefits, thankfully, if you have them, and not everyone does, but if you have them, short-term disability benefits, I don't think I've ever seen a short-term disability policy that had a pre-existing exclusion clause. So if it was something that typically, uh, if you do become disabled from it, is something that will keep you off work for a couple months but isn't something that's long-term, then it probably doesn't matter as much. Okay. Because for short-term disability benefits, pre-existing exclusions do not apply. 
check your policy to be sure, but again, I haven't seen one where it does. But for long-term disability, it is something that you really do need to be aware of. I know you're not an insurance broker by any stretch, but is this something you can purchase a rider to get rid of that sort of thing? Have you ever seen that before on your own, uh, you know? An extension to what the policy provides? Well, so typically you would be looking at uh, a private policy in that scenario. Okay. And so if you're talking about a private policy, they're almost always going to require a medical examination. Usually it's by a paramedical, a nurse or, or someone of that nature who will come and run you through the battery of you know a typical physical and then ask you a number of medical questions and so it would be considered at that phase and you have to be honest uh, when you're doing that and so if you do have this pre-existing issue it could be dealt with in a couple of ways either uh, they might just reject your 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 application outright or they may say that okay well uh, we'll approve this policy and you're covered under this policy, but there's an exclusion for this particular condition. And that exclusion may just be permanent throughout the life of the policy or it may be excluded for the first year or however long it is. The reality is, you know, an insurance policy is a contract and in theory at least, it can be molded to whatever makes sense to both parties as long as they agree to it. Right. So there are options that you have if it's a private policy, but for most group policies, there won't be a rider that you'll be able to get around. And it's generally, in, in your experience, the year, once you're into month 13, you're good to go, but for the first 12, you got to watch it, right? Yeah, it, yeah, for okay. sure. It is something that, you know, you do want to, if you if you have access to it, you want to take a look at the specific wording of your policy and satisfy yourself. Nice. Because although we talk about disability policies as though they are all uniform, they're not. Mm -hmm. Most of the variants, though, aren't in the core uh, tests and the, the core parts of the policy. So when we're talking about the typical test for long-term disability benefits, that's almost always the same policy to policy. But the pre-existing exclusion can have some substantive differences from one policy to the other. So it is important if you're concerned about that in any way or if you're in that situation that you look at the policy and you f figure out what the exact wording is so you don't get caught in that situation where you've made a move and now all of a sudden you don't have coverage when you really need it. Yeah. All right, good stuff. PocketDisabilityLawyer.ca. That's a website you want to use. It was put together to make it easy for you to just kind of basically do a self-assessment of whether you should be carrying on with a, a claim or not. You just answer a series of quick drop-down questions. It takes like literally a minute, 30 seconds to do this. You've got an answer at the bottom. You can use that any time. PocketDisabilityLawyer.ca is where you want to go for that. Uh, as well, James and I and Tamara do a ton of radio across the country and right here in the GTA as well. Reach out by phone during the show. We'd love to talk to you. Have your questions on air and call in any other time, uh, as a matter of fact. If you simply go to DisabilityLawyer.ca, you'll be able to find a drop-down menu and a station near you where you can tune in and catch the show. Want to get to one of our phone calls, James, from one of the radio shows right now and talk about it. Listen up. I've been on long-term disability for about three years now. I work for the provincial government. I'm still ill. I cannot go back to work. But I've gotten a new case manager, and she called and asked a whole bunch of questions. So I'm a little, you know, paranoid. Is it possible that they can cut me off now? Like, even though I'm still disabled and I have all doctors and specialist notes? Well, it's an interesting question, and... The caller is right to have some concern. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are going to cut you off. But there's a new uh, case manager that's been assigned to the file. That's unfortunately all too common. That happens all the time. We have people contact, contacting us that have been denied. And oftentimes the first thing they say is, I've had seven different case managers over the last 12 months. Moving around. And, I mean, that's a lot. You know, That's probably a more extreme example than we typically see, but I've heard it. And it's not unusual at all to see a new case, new case manager every four or five months. That happens all the time. And turns out it's a pretty high turnover job. It isn't something where you see a lot of people staying in there for years, years and years and years. It's often something where the people in that position don't have a ton of experience doing it. Not always the case, but that is not unusual to see that. When you have a case manager, whether they're new on the file or whether they've been there for a while, and all of a sudden they start contacting you more frequently, asking you for more information, yeah, there's a reason to be concerned. Doesn't mean that they're going to cut you off, but where there's smoke, often there is fire. What do you do about that? Well, unfortunately, there's not much that you can do, unless it's getting to the point of them harassing you. That doesn't seem to be the case here, and I'm not going to jump to that conclusion. But if they are asking you for regular updates, more regular than they used to, they're asking you for updates on what you're doing, on your treatment, 
on your day-to-day, -day, I would do my best to provide them with that information. Obviously, you want to be aware of what the scenario is, that this is a person that their job requirement is to try and eventually find a way to get you off of claim. And so you want to be careful about what you say, but you have to be honest with them. You can't lie to your claims handler. If they catch you in that, you're in trouble. It means that not only are they going to cut off your benefits, but they might have a basis for coming after you for benefits they've already paid. So you have to be honest with your claims handler, but be careful about what you're saying and be careful about the kind of language that you're using as well, too. You don't want to be too friendly with them. And I'm by no means suggesting you need to be rude or aggressive in any way, shape or form. But claims handlers, especially good claims handlers, will try to make you believe that they're your friend, that they're there to help you, that they're just trying to help guide you through the system, get you from A to B. That's not what they're there for. They are employed by the insurance company and the objective of the insurance company and the claims handler is to get you off of the claim. They want to stop paying you the benefits. So have your guard up, answer the questions politely, but don't feel any need to provide more information than what they're asking for. Explain only when you need to. Give them the information politely. If you don't, the problem, of course, is that that will be a basis for them to say, okay, well, you're not cooperating with us anymore, so we're now entitled to cut off your benefits. And in many situations, if you stop talking to them, if you stop providing them with reasonable requests for information, they will have a basis for cutting off your claim. So unfortunately, you are going to need to comply with that. If they do cut you off, then you give us a call and we can look at starting a claim right away. Is this one of those things where, A, you should always keep notes post-phone call? It doesn't have to be verbatim like a court reporter, but you should at least make some, some basic notes about the conversation. Number two, when you talk about speaking to a claims handler, very common speak vernacular. If you were to call me tomorrow and say, John, how are you? I'm great, man. I'm great. I could be off with a flu or a broken toe, but I'm going to tell you I feel great. That might not be the response for your claims handler, right? John, it's like you've... I've done the show. Like you've done the show before, and <laughs> you, you know what I'm going to say. No, it, it, those are excellent points, of course. So, yes, you want to be careful about the language that you're using. The example that you just provided is perfect. That's exactly what I'm talking about. How you doing? Uh, great. Which is what you might say without even thinking about of course. it. Of Don't. Um, <laughs> it's it, it, just don't. Just tell them what is happening. Take a pause and tell them what's happening. But the first thing you said is even more important than that, and that is the. Uh, the idea that you should make sure that there is a written record of every conversation that you have. Oftentimes, insurance companies like to do this by phone. Even if you ask for them to communicate with you by email, they'll still say, no, we're going to do this by phone. If you're in that situation, what I would do is every time your insurance company contacts you, by phone, I would say, okay, hold on for just a second. I'm just getting a pad of paper. And write down everything that they are saying. You don't have to do it verbatim, as you mentioned. It doesn't have to be a transcript. But the substance of everything being said, you need to get that down. Everything they say and everything you say. You want to make sure that there is a written record of that. And as soon as the conversation is over, draft an email just saying, I'm confirming wow, good. that today we had a conversation you said this, I said this. You asked this, I told you this. You don't have to analyze what it means. You don't have to come to any conclusions. You don't have to throw any accusations out there. This is just a factual summary of what was said in the conversation. Nothing more, nothing less. Once you've sent that, there is now a written record of that conversation. And if the claims handler doesn't reply and say, no, I disagree, yes, agree. that's not what you said. If they don't say anything about it at the time, then if down the road they try and suggest that that's not what the conversation, that's not what was said in the conversation, no one's going to buy that because you sent it to them, they had a chance to disagree, and they didn't. So you make sure that you get your version of the events out there as soon as the conversation is finished. What you should know about uh, addiction and disability claims, that's coming up on the other side of the break. We'll get into that right now. In the meantime, here's that phone number again to reach James and his team, one 855 821-5900, help at disabilityrights.ca. We continue with more of the Disability Law Show. People think you should go to the government to get severance pay. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Government can only help you get minimum severance, but not everything you're entitled to. Always check with the Employment Lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. If your long-term disability claim is denied, should you appeal? Appeals often fail because insurance companies control the process. So long as you appeal, you're playing by their rules. You should never appeal the denial of your disability benefits. 
Appeals are just a mirage of false hope. Don't, that's their process. Take it out of their hands and fight for your rights with our help. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think their employer can make changes to their job. Employmentlawyer.ca says that is a myth. Your employer can't change your pay, hours, or duties. You may be entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back, Disability Law Show. Thank you so much for sticking around through the break. John Scholes here, James Fireman right there. You can always reach James for a phone call. It won't cost you anything to pick up a phone. Ask a few questions for James and his team, 1-855-821-5900. Email help at disabilityrights.ca. Okay, James, moving on. What you should know about addiction and disability claims, super important topic. We'll dive right into this one. Number one, under most disability policies, substance abuse and addiction are deemed disabilities. What say you? Yeah, I mean, this is very straightforward. They are deemed disabilities, but I think it is worthy of its own, own subtopic here mm -hmm. because it is misunderstood by a lot of people. And more significantly, there are a lot of people that are suffering from addiction that are afraid of the stigma attached to that, right. that don't want to come forward or, and are concerned about what that will mean for them coming forward. And that's fair. I would love to say that we exist in a time where people fully understand what addiction means and how people who are addicted to a substance should be treated, but we don't. It's true that there are many people that are living 20, 30 years ago and believe that because you have an addiction, it makes you a bad person or a bad employee or what have you. It's simply not the case. And certainly, it is not how disability policies work. Addiction, addiction issues, Medical conditions that are caused by addiction are absolutely compensable. If you have an addiction that's preventing you from being able to do your job and it's medically confirmed, you are entitled to disability benefits. That is simply the way that the law works. And cases that have been before the courts in the past have confirmed this time and time again. It is not a personal failing because you have an addiction. It is a medical condition, and that is something that entitles you to disability benefits, full stop. Aren't you kind of sliding over to human rights violations at one point when you deny this? Stuff? It certainly can. It right. certainly can, and that is a broader topic yep. where there are policies that specifically exclude addictions, and we used to see that a lot more frequently, but it isn't something that I've seen in any new policies over the last 10 or 15 years. Occasionally, we'll have someone come in who is covered under a policy that's been kicking around for 25, 30 years, and we'll see that kind of language still embedded in the policy, but it isn't something that we have to deal with on those terms where there's just a blanket uh, exclusion for any type of addiction, thankfully. Point number two about addiction and disability claims. Claimants hoping to receive LTD benefits must seek and undergo treatment. So that's true for people who have disabilities related to addiction or any disability. Right. That's just a requirement under any long-term disability policy, that if you have a medical condition, you're required to seek any reasonable treatment that's recommended. Now, there are policies out there, and some that are more recent than I would like, that will say that if you are suffering from a disability related to addiction, you, you are not entitled to benefits unless you are participating in an uh, in treatment where you're in-house. Like a 12-step or an in-house program. Well, it, no, and it, uh, there are some that say that you actually have, have to, to be, be in there. treatment where you have to go to a facility where you're staying there for a, an extended period of time, be it three weeks, six weeks, three months, whatever it is. Wow. Now, that type of policy to me is absolutely incorrect. And if, it is, if an insurance company is saying that you have to do this no matter what, then frankly, they have no basis to rely on that because if you are suffering from addiction, and I'm by no means qualified to tell anyone what to do for addiction or any other medical condition. I'm just not medically trained. But I certainly know that there are some addictions, there are some people that are suffering from addiction where uh, in-person treatment is absolutely necessary and is going to be recommended by any doctor. And there are many others where it's not, where it would not be appropriate, where it actually might be counterproductive and work against that person. 
And the treatment has to be suitable for the individual, whether it's in person or not, whether it's something with, that you are in clinic for an extended period of time or whether it's something where you're outpatient and you're being treated on a regular basis, be it once a week or three times a week or whatever the case may be. It has to be appropriate for your particular medical situation. And like everything else, addiction lies on a continuum. It is not a binary thing where you are or you aren't. It is something where there are different degrees and the level of treatment required for that is going to change depending on the extent of your condition and your individual circumstances. It's tailor-made for you. It's your addiction. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so any policy where it says that you have to be inpatient, where you have to be uh, away for an extended period of time, to me, is absolutely uh, inappropriate. And if that is the basis for an exclusion, it is something that I would love to challenge in court. Yeah. Point number three when it comes to addiction and disability claims is this, James. A relapse or regression can lead to a cutoff from benefits by insurers despite that being the nature of addiction, right? Well, so that is true as a matter of fact. There are certainly many situations that I have seen where somebody who has a, an addiction where it is disabling them and they are on disability has been cut off because they have had a relapse. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that's the way the policy works or the way the law sees it. It means that that's an insurance company acting the way insurance companies act. Insurance companies, again, they're looking for a justification to stop paying your benefits. And if they find one, they're going to grab hold of it and they're not going to let go, even if it isn't something that they're entitled to rely on, such as a relapse. And this is very clear in the law. Courts have considered the nature of addiction on many, many occasions, and the consensus is clear. Relapsing is part of the typical course of somebody who has an addiction. And the fact that you've had a relapse does not in and of itself mean that you're not entitled to benefits. Now, if you have a relapse and you're refusing to submit to further treatment, that's a different story because you are required to continue to get treatment as recommended and as required. But if you are continuing the effort to get treatment and you happen to relapse, that doesn't mean you're not entitled to your benefits. And if your insurance company has cut off your benefits after a relapse, even though you are willing and have, in fact, continued to go to treatment, then you're entitled to continue to get your benefits and we can start a legal claim right away. Lots more to go, but we'll take a short break before we get into that. Some emails as well to uh, reach out to James and his team. Give them a call on your own time, 1-855-821-5900. And that email is help at disabilityrights.ca. You're watching the Disability Law Show and we're coming right back. People think contractors aren't owed severance. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. Many contractors are actually employees and are entitled to full severance pay. Always check with the employment lawyer first at EmploymentLawyer.ca. How do you force insurance companies to pay long-term disability claims? Insurance companies deny legitimate claims all the time. They're playing the odds. They know that most people are just going to walk away. Your insurer may ignore you, they may even ignore your doctors, but they can't ignore us. We know how insurance companies work. We know their weaknesses. We know how to use the legal process to force them to pay you what you're owed. Go to disabilityrights.ca, discover your rights, fight back and get what you're owed. People think you are only owed two weeks pay when you lose your job. EmploymentLawyer.ca says that is a myth. You may be owed much more than two weeks per year. Don't settle for less. Always check with the employment lawyer first at employmentlawyer.ca. And welcome back, Disability Law Show. John Scholes and James Fireman. A few minutes to go. I want to get an email in here uh, right away, James. This one from Lee. By the way, you can send one along anytime. Help at disability rights.ca. Lee says, my wife stopped working nearly a year ago due to workplace harassment leading to anxiety and PTSD. As advised by her doctor and psychiatrist, despite this, the insurance company claims her condition is situational and suggests she can work elsewhere, go somewhere else. Can she still qualify for long-term disability benefits? Well, assuming that what the insurance company has said that she's able to work elsewhere is incorrect, then she certainly can. Right. And so let me go into a little bit more detail about what I mean there. When you have a disability that arises out of a workplace situation, whether it's workplace harassment or what is often referred to as a toxic work environment, mm -hmm. 
Insurance companies love to point to that and say, okay, well, this is a workplace issue. You're not entitled to benefits, full stop. But that's not the way that it works. You can absolutely have a disability that is caused strictly by something that happens at work. But if the result is a general condition that is impacting your ability to work, not just for your employer, but for any other employer, then you're entitled to benefits. It doesn't matter that it started as a workplace issue. And there's something in Lee's email that tells me that his wife is almost certainly going to fall into that category because she's suffering from anxiety and PTSD. PTSD is a really significant diagnosis. That is not something that is uh, come to lightly. It is something that requires significant clinical observation and the impact of that PTSD. I, I, I mean, I don't think there's going to be many situations where that is going to be strictly situational to your workplace. It could be, I suppose, and I'm not qualified to say one way or the other. Mm. But that she is diagnosed with PTSD suggests to me that this has gotten to a point, a severity, where it's likely going to be uh, applicable in all situations, where it's a generalized condition. And if that is the case, then she certainly would be entitled to her benefits. I want to get to another one, this one from MyDisabilityQuestions.com, another free website for you to use anytime. Rhea says, I've been battling debilitating long COVID symptoms since contracting it two years ago and was approved for LTD. Recently, my adjuster has been insisting on a psychiatrist assessment. My condition is not psychological, and I'm not sure why they're asking me for this. Do I have to attend? Well, first of all, I want to congratulate Rhea because she's one of the few people I've seen who are suffering from long COVID that have, in fact, been approved. So that's great. Yeah. One of the reasons why long COVID is frequently denied, especially out of the gate, is because there isn't an objective test for it. And very frequently, it's something where uh, there isn't a way to relate it to some other condition. And so the insurance companies will just use that as a hole to drive the truck straight through and say, okay, you're not entitled to benefits. What's happening here is your insurance company is looking for a basis to deny. They've already said that your condition is disabling or has been disabling. So now it looks like they're trying to relate that to another condition, a mental health condition. And certainly I have seen many people, many clients that have come to me that have long COVID that also are suffering from mental health yep. issues either because of the long COVID or something that they've had for some period of time before that's gotten worse because of it. But whether or not that is going to be determinative in this case, I don't know. It may well be the case that there is a psychological component and you'll go to a psychiatrist or a psychologist and they'll say, yes, you have anxiety or depression or whatever they diagnose you with, but it is not fully disabling. And then the insurance company uses that as a basis to say, okay, well, we, we sent you to our expert and they said you're not disabled. The problem with that is, of course, if you're suffering from long COVID, it isn't just about your mental health. Maybe partially about that, but it is also about whatever other symptoms are affecting you. And typically we're talking about extreme fatigue or body ache or cognitive issues. And that's not something the psychologist or the psychiatrist will be testing for. So it is a ploy that insurance companies often use to try and artificially narrow your disability and then get, a, get an opinion that says, well, this particular slice of your disability isn't fully disabling, isn't totally disabling, and therefore you're not disabled. That's just not the way that it works. And so if the result of this is that Ray is cut off, we can certainly start a claim. But do you have to attend? Unfortunately, you do. Because it is reasonable for the insurance company to believe that it could be part of the condition. So they're entitled to the assessment, but if they use it as a basis to deny, we can start a claim. Which you should, and reach out any other time now that we are complete for this show. Thank you so much for contributing if you did. And moving forward, you can always get a hold of James and his team. 1-855-821-5900, the phone number. Help at disabilityrights.ca and mydisabilityquestions.com as well. We'll catch you next time right here on the Disability Law Show.